that's all. See you there. We'll keep it, keep it rolling. There we go. There we go. straight to you for a question if, if that's all right uh, it might be time uh, to get something off your chest possibly um, did you kill Queenie um, <laughs> or, 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 people or, still ask me that hey <laughs> who killed Queenie it's a big mystery it was a it's been a clam uh, could have been viola but I don't know you you didn't like that dog so I just want to ask you to uh, get the important question out first <laughs> Queenie. Queenie, Queenie was actually a story I borrowed from a, a, a cousin, someone, you know, a cousin. I'm not, I'm not saying names, but just it came from somewhere else. <laughs> creative, you know, license. Okay, okay. <laughs> we can move on. I mean, uh, well, maybe you can start at the at the beginning because this is. Um, and I have a follow-up question down the road about the name of the original story uh, that's referenced in the movie, but like, you wrote the first story, but talk about how it became a family affair and how it maybe morphed from the original vision to what we're seeing here on screen. Sure. So I would, I would like to just, I'll talk about the genesis, actually, of it, if I may. Um, my brothers and I- the mic. Is the mic on? Is this on? Yes. So my brothers and I, uh, five of us, we grew up in, in Brooklyn. We were, we were street kids. Um, Fort Greene. We grew up in Cobble Hill and Fort Greene. And, uh, but really this takes, yeah, the memories really are from Fort Greene. So when I was a little girl, maybe around the age of Troy, actually, uh, my mother asked me to start collecting all of the street games and songs that my friends and I played, that all of us played on the street. And I don't know what she was intending. She, my mother was ahead of her time, so perhaps she was intending to create some sort of anthology of street games. So from that, she planted the seed. And it gave me permission to start observing as a child. And I started recording and remembering incidents, um, just visual. So that really is the genesis of the film and how I was able to start. I, I took that assignment, basically, years later remembered uh, this period in my life. And I started, I'd never written a script before. So I just started writing scenes. And I was sharing that scene. And he was sort of um, kind of shepherded, you know, the, uh, the writing process for me. And then what happened? Oh, I don't know. You guys, what are you two? And, and then from there, um, I took it to Spike or asked Spike if he could take a look at the script. I don't remember to tell you how it's like, but I think that's pretty much what happened. Uh, and Spike was like, ah, this is a pretty good what, script that you guys did. I said, oh, it was really Joy's, Joy's script. And, uh, and Spike was like, all right, let me take a pass at it. You know, make it you know filmable for him. Uh, you wanted to do, and uh, we're off to the races. And that original version was called Hot Piece of Butter, which was one of which were. Uh, oh, you know what Hot Piece of Butter is. Who knows Hot Piece of Butter is? Well, the, nobody. The, nobody for the for the movie. It's a game, but I didn't really I wasn't clear no, on all the rules. Watching this, if I can say this now, all these street games. Lost forever. Hot piece of butter. 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 Hot pi
piece of butter. Come and get your stuff, but a rental video or a focal video. Uh, Skelly. What? Skelly. I mean, Double Dutch is still around, but you know, it's not as video shit. But we, <laughs> we had kids. We had to use our imagination, so we had street games. And that stuff was lost. I think it's sad. And that part of part of that preservation was, I think, what my mother was intending. It's not too late for a little coffee table book. I'm just saying. So they're not totally gone. We could, well, we could bring it back. There's a cookbook. So I want to I want to talk about the the kids who are all like to a kid amazing in this film. Um, so uh, you know Zelda um, is such an incredible character, and so I want to ask all of you about like how do you cast, how do you find the right role, and then if it's you, like if they're representing you, like what what little elements are you looking for? And you can you can all answer that question. Yeah, that was one. Of, that was one of the fun parts about it was going to these, you know, local schools yeah. and stuff like that, and going to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids. So it was like, wow, that you know, I was looking for things that you could see. It wasn't that far away from nineteen seventy. I think the film takes place in nineteen seventy. Seventy two. Seventy two. So. Um, which, which kid were you? Uh, so, so I'm assuming Clinton is you with the glasses. Maybe that I don't know, but I'm, I'm the oldest. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't. I don't know. So you, you see, you can't ask who Clinton. You just see who it was a game seven, May eighth, nineteen seventy. On their first world championship, you don't know which one I was. <laughs> I, 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 I knew who you were. Phrase in my room. <laughs> 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 That's a true story. My father gave a concert. <laughs> Same night. <laughs> Game seven. The Knicks versus the Lakers. And my father had a concert that night. My mother said, you have to make a choice. I said, I'm going to the game. <laughs> I didn't, still don't regret it. <laughs> I can't make more concerts after this. <laughs> but uh, my father, you know, is a great, great musician. And uh, me and my brother Chris, who's, who's deceased, he would have us be playing at uh, Candy Hall, it's right next to Tom, uh, Tom Hall in uh, Manhattan, Midtown, and have us hand out flyers to total strangers. This is like Midtown. People were like, kid, kid, get out of my, get out of my way. <laughs> and they knew my father was just trying to go home. And so it was very painful to see my, this great musician, you know, be us and Uncle Cliff, uh, uh, Nancy, and you know, his brothers, and we were like the only motherfuckers in there. And it was, it was not funny. It was painful. And so, it's glad that later on that uh, he started doing the scores for my first in at first in film school, and then she's been having school days do the right thing in Mobile Blues, so he was able to, wow. to find the recognition that he deserved. Building. Building. Wow. But you know that I like to give a love to. Dylan who played our father, and also Alfred Wood, who played our father. And, uh, you know, I was a sophomore at Morehouse, and uh, my father said, come on home, your mother's dying. So I came back from Atlanta, and my mother was hanging on. I was home for like two, two weeks. And he said, Spike, go back to school. So I went back to Atlanta. Plain land, I called the house. I said, uh, how's mommy doing? And Aunt Nancy, my Uncle Cliff, uh, she's the mother of Malcolm Lee. As you know, our cousins were very fine filmmaker. And she was, no one picked up the phone. She picked up the phone. She said, uh, no one told you? I said, no, I mean, I just got home. 
I said, your mother passed. I said, then I had to go back, leave school again to, to go to the, the funeral. So it was very, very uh, autobiographical. It's, uh, how, um, does it affect you every single time you see it? I mean, this must be, it's an amazing portrait of a, a, a period of lives. It's, uh, it's, uh, and when was the last time you've seen it? And, and is it this I haven't impact seen on this film in years. And this is the first time I've seen it projected in a long, long time. So I hope that everybody, you know, as much seen as projected, and I'm glad, and thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity to show this film. Not video, you know. <laughs> You know, to see in a big, big, beautiful theater, and thank you for you know uh, dedication. Everybody coming out and giving us, uh, you know, the Lee family a chance to share our, our story. With, as, with, uh, with it is our, it's our pleasure. Our pleasure. Woo! I'm not, however, going to let you escape the question about kids. <laughs> so uh, I want to like let's start with Zelda because. Uh, Force of nature, like was that you? Is that is that you up on screen? And and how do you craft? How do you, as the original mold, craft that performance? Or help? <laughs> I don't know. Did you guide her to become you? I guess. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, we. It was like summer camp, where we gathered the kids and worked with the kids. And Zelda was. I call Zelda my, my uh, or Troy is my fictional daughter. Was she a teacher at the <laughs> Nah, she's like some big school. She, she's grown now. Yes. <laughs> she's, she's, a, she's a brilliant young woman. She's amazing. She's an amazing person. And the Millennium, though, that was a, this was her first film. Yeah. yeah. Zelda was just, uh, I mean, in retrospect, we. Some, it, was like, it was sort of like, what's that? There you go. Oh, sorry. It was almost like a summer camp. So we just, you know, this immersion of the period, of the language, of the relationship, really kind of creating, establishing the dynamic uh, between the siblings. And also she and I were together, uh, alone together. Uh, so it was some sort of, some sort of form of boot camp and she was just a sponge and just, she's just an amazing, I mean, this is her, it, it's not just me, I'm, t I'm not taking credit for her performance, she is who she is, she's just an amazing talent. And also, she had Spike as a director and she was also under the guidance of, as you said, um, uh, Delroy Lindo and, and Alfred Woodard. So, I mean, kids are sponges and they kind of fell into that, but, but, Zelda would do, I would crack up sometimes on the set because Zelda would do things just even kind of off camera, just the way she would behave. Um, I would, you know, she just really kind of assumed the character and inhabited the character and I just, she's just amazing. She's just amazing and I, I love working with her. It was an incredible experience. And, and all the kids, all the, all the children. And not just, I mean, even the tertiary, tertiary characters. Like I was just talking about the young girl um, in the supermarket. We were just talking with, with Ashley about that. Um, that supermarket scene when Zelda goes in and then there's a the little girl, uh, Pina. Yeah. You know, yeah. Troy's never said. Yeah. <laughs> Pina was based on an actual character and I would go around Myrtle Avenue and I would always, there was always somebody ready to kick my ass. Houses <laughs> were. <laughs> because I wore, you know, my back then cornrows or maybe the kind of hippie clothes that my mother dressed me in. So there was, I was just, Peanut had it in for me. <laughs> so that, but the, the girl, the actor, the child actor that we cast, I don't know how we found this child. Her name is Kawana Bonaparte, and she's just amazing. I mean, it was, it was just, she just it inhabited this, this character. I mean, she even looked like her. <laughs> so I don't know. So um, I think I'm getting it right. Kumish Mimish. Is that right? Is that uh, so? Is yes, that my from father? That was the yeah. head name for 
Is there any significance to that? What does that mean? I don't, I, I can never really understand. It's nonsensical. Nonsense, okay. But my father, my father, he was a performer. <laughs> so he was always, it's almost like a scat, you know, maybe some version of that, but it's, it's a pet name. My first name is Joy, by the way. I just want to state that. I am. Thank you, middle name. <laughs> my name is Joy Susanna Lee. <laughs> so then you changed it. Then. I, I'm still Joy. I'm going. I'm returning to Joy. Oh, newsflash! <laughs> when this happened? There's some simple shit up here. <laughs> and you know, we've had you saw the films. We've had we've had a complicated relationship. <laughs> and she was, I mean, she was the only girl. So you, 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 four brothers, and she had it rough. <laughs> and, we had, and like she said, just we, we were crazy. <laughs> I mean, our relatives all oh, know there's some um, bad Lee kids so coming our way. <laughs> we were just too much sugar. So, <laughs> father, oh. My father put a five pound bag of Domino sugar in the Kool-Aid. And back then, I mean, people weren't born, but that our generation, we were crackheads on sugar. <laughs> the cereal, the candies, I mean, sugar, sugar, sugar. So it, it definitely affected me. <laughs> we sugar addicts. It's just the generation. All of, that's why I put all those TV commercials. They have the cereal, tricks, and all that. It was just sugar. Well, I had I had a serious sugar habit, and I would creep out at night and run around the corner to the bodega and just you know stack up on all the junk. And How we? This is what, this is Troy. I, no, but I, no, I, was, I was in college when you was just. Uh, I was a child. <laughs> I was 10 years old when I was. And kid. you left the house? Yes, I would creep out. In nighttime? Yes. And no one knew? Because that was my sugar habit. I didn't even know you left the house? Nobody did. <laughs> Damn, I'm glad I shit out now. I'm getting these motherfucking years later. I was stealth, and I would run my tail down the block, around to Bird Lounge in the bodega. And that is where all, it was a different life. And that's where Troy sees. Uh, On Berta Avenue. In the bodega, just the nightlife of the bodega and how it transformed, you know, at night and, sun, and being this observer. So we're seeing Troy in the film observe, you know, this activity and behavior and, and the dancing and the relationship that. Yeah, was, that oh. was, was that dance, that, uh, which is probably. I don't know, is that the single most erotic dance in film history? I don't know, maybe, it's up there, top 10. Uh, is that real, is that like a real memory of you saw a scene? That's, that's an actual memory. Oh, wow. That, I mean, these, the film is based on memory. The film is a memory. Yeah, but Not, you, didn't, you didn't kill the dog, so I'm just saying there's some, oh, there's yeah. some fiction there's, in there's, story. Yes, there is, it is a work of fiction, but these are, but it's, it, it comes from memory. It all comes from memory. And yeah, so that is, that you really, particular You incident. really did that to my Buffalo Nichols? I stole your bubble and nickel, but I did that. But this is what I mean. I just, I don't know how, you know, this, is, this, is, how, this is how creativity works. I wish I had the bubble nickels now. That'd be worth a lot of money. The bubble of nickels I stole when I was five or six when we lived in Cobble Hill, and I didn't know the value of them, and I wanted to get an ice cream cone because I was going to the corner store and wanted ice cream. Oh. And he had questions. I didn't know that they were worth anything, so I went and Jack and Bill's. Of Henry and Washington and uh, Warren Street. We were the first black family to move into Cobble Hill. And back then it was stone on time in America. And so the first couple of weeks we got a call, Mooley, Mooleon, they get this and they get that. And then when they were sold, they're working at me a lot of more Mooleons and Mooleys and niggas moving behind us. They were good. <laughs> and, and that that planted the seeds for for do the right thing all the whole time American African American racial then jungle fever and the 
later on, you know, with, with, with Summer Sam. We just started there in, in uh, Cobble Hill, and I went to PS 29 on Baltic Street. And my dear friends, they in the Tucci's, Lou and Joe Tucci and Donna Tucci. So, you know, we, we were first black family in Cobble Hill. But our mother always wanted, first we lived, we, I was born in Atlanta. Then we then we Chicago. Then we moved to Crown Heights, 1480 Union Street. And then the small apartment, our landlord was mean West Indian. She used to say all the time. Me. She said that. She said it. She says mean got a mean West Indian landlord. So she said, get out of here. We moved to we moved to Crown Heights. Moved to Cobble Hill. Oh, my mother always wanted to have a brownstone. So 1968, we bought our brownstone for $45,000 at Washington Park in Femurro, Florida. $45,000. Because no one, realtors, they wouldn't say Fort Green. They would say downtown vicinity. <laughs> Been to Fort Green lately? Yeah. <laughs> well, our family moved during actually white flight. It was during that period of time. And, not, and actually, the, in the film, the, the neighbors in which uh, who, who send in the film, the Caucasian neighbors who sandwich the Carmichael, the Italian mother and daughter and also the um tony eyes tony eyes thank you so those are actual that, that his house so tony eyes is real tony eyes is tell, real. tell us about tony oh, eyes man, and you really dress like that in the summertime it was we couldn't even sit in our stoop because he had like 50 dogs <laughs> and, and he, he would just he would defecate all in the house and it would just smell like caca <laughs> Or Spanish people, Spanish people speaking words. Ha, ha. He called himself a dog breeder and he bred poodles. <laughs> yeah, poodles with all mouth caca in it. <laughs> so they just multiplied because they didn't spay and neuter or anything back then. I guess I don't know. He didn't even walk. He just kept them in the house. Well, so he kept them in the house, and then they and they they would do all their business in the backyard, so we could never go out back. So there was just they just. Shat everywhere. And they every, did, did business in the house too. They did do the business. It was it was it was a really bizarre um, character. And Tony, what was his name? No, I'm not telling his name. He's <laughs> dead. First name was Tony. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. So, but, but he also played him. Classical music, you know, my yeah, dad no, does not. he did not play classical music. Was it opera? Played, no, he played Muzak. <laughs> <laughs> so it would just seep through the walls, and that just was. My, well, my father, our father, crazy. Our father was, um, what do you say? He just, my father didn't want anything. He didn't listen, everything was acoustic. You know, that music was just. He's a jazz purist. Yes, a jazz purist, that's right. So I'm worried, but we had, uh, you. You were little, but we had, uh, we couldn't, he didn't want to hear no Motown, Beatles, nothing. So we had a little transistor radio, so we had to like, <laughs> turn that bad music on! <laughs> he didn't want to hear none of that. Hey, so the, uh, the music in the film, I mean, this is a destroyer of a soundtrack. It is like one of the best of all times. Um, how many of these tracks are like literal conduits to your childhood, have significant meaning, where they're placed within it? Um, I, I assume, Spike, this is a lot of your curation. All, all your curation. The music guy lives, Miss Music Guy, grew up to we every Saturday morning. We get up, get up, sir, and watch, so <laughs> no, and this this is our our youth growing up in Brooklyn, and the music that we heard, one hundred and seven point five WBLS. <laughs> See, a lot of 
you don't know what we're talking about, but I mean, that's Frankie Crocker, the chief rocker. Come on now, I mean, this is the music we listen to, the music we grew up to, and uh, definitely have, you know, we there are Puerto Ricans in our block. So that was, uh, I mean, we grew up. That's where, that's why Tia's Puerto Rican do the right thing. I mean, we, we grew up in the same neighborhood. We was in Brooklyn or the Bronx. Hip hop was created by West Indian, from the Caribbean, black folks and Puerto Ricans. They, that's how hip hop started. So it was essential that we show all these people that lived on, on our block, but all the blocks, you know, that I, it was just, it was like that. Um, so the closing track, also a killer, but it's named after the film, and I want to talk about the, the title of the film, Crooklyn. So, the what? Uh, title of the film, Crooklyn. It's, uh, it's the first time I had heard it used. Was this uh, is a term that you use when you were kids, or where did where did the name come from? Well, as as my sister said, the original title was Hot Peas and Butter, yeah. which is uh, why did you describe the game Hot Peas and Butter? No, the question is how did you? How no, did you, you know, 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 but, I never heard Crooklyn before. You but that, but but before, why talk about Crooklyn? We are, uh, look, let me do talk for this. <laughs> the original title was Hot Peas and Butter. Yes, and a lot was. of people might not know what that is. I'm describing the, the street game that we played. It was a game where you had a belt. And whoever was it, you had the belt. So you had to hide the belt. And you had a home base. So once you hit the belt, you would say, hot peas and butter, come and get your supper. And everyone would try to find the belt. And you would say, you're warm, you're cold, you're hot, you're hot, you're very hot. And then the person to find the belt, they could whip anybody <laughs> before you got the home base. That's, that's, Hot piece of butter was a street game we played. And we were ruthless. <laughs> if you didn't get back to home base, and you were, and you had the belt in your hand, you would tear that ass off. <laughs> <laughs> and these are street games that we play. I mean, if you look at the, the opening credit sequence, those are all the games we played growing up. We had to use our imagination. I mean, we had to rock and sock the robot, but other than that, <laughs> it's street games. So, I just felt that, uh, and I want another title. I mean, for me, Hot Peas and Butter was too obscure, and I don't really want to frame it like, this film's about Brooklyn, the Brooklyn that we grew up in, and it's no longer around, so we know we've got this, uh, for preservation of that era and, and kids growing up in Brooklyn. I'm going to go back because I believe there's an unanswered question for Simke. Which brother are you? And the youngest, the, the youngest one. The youngest one. Okay. And uh, same. Did you uh, <laughs> did you have time Chelsea. ensuring? <laughs> Uh, that he was portraying you in a, an appropriate light. Like, what was your relationship with that actor? Um, he wasn't. He wasn't that much. He was like me, smaller than his. Um, what am I trying to say? He was. He looked like a little kid, but he really wasn't. Kind of like me. <laughs> <laughs> he and Zelda were actually the same age. They were both eight years old. So I know that probably might have done a number on Sema because he was smaller. Shorter than, than Zelda, mm -hmm. and also treated in this way, kind of to defy family hierarchy. Oh, he, he did not like people picking him up. Me, me, you picking me up? Look down. So um, yeah, he was awesome. The, Great. Yeah, working with the kids was just so much fun. I remember when I I, I saw one of the kids in the film, in the, in the, cult, in the cult, 
Joy up. I was like, you gotta see this girl. She's awesome. She's awesome. She's she's. I'm like, I, 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 I. was that Zelda? That was Zelda. Yeah. yeah. So Seiki and I were accompanied Aisha Coley, who worked with Roddy Lee. She was the New York casting director. So we would we would go to we would we would be at the casting sessions with Aisha. If I wasn't there that day, Seiki was, and we saw. Where did Zelda come? I don't even know. She came from. It was an open call. Yeah, she lived in New York. She lived in New York. Yeah. Had the kids uh, acted before? Uh, the, the, the kind of just first, uh, just raw, just raw, just being kids. Maybe school? Yeah. High school? I mean, not even high school. Uh, like middle school? Lower school? Zelda might have been on Sesame Street or something like that, but this was so I don't remember exactly. Actually, I think Sharif had asked. He plays the. Now, Wendell. one of the kids, Pee Wee Herman, or Pee Wee, what's his name? Pee Wee. Not Pee Wee. Love? Yeah, Pee Wee Love. He's, he, he was in like three more films. <laughs> and Carlton Nelly is the character who played. Um, no, I'm sorry, his, na his oh, name? Oh. No, no, I'm sorry. No. Carlton, I'm forgetting his last name. This is embarrassing, but he's a character. Spike's fictional doppelganger. He's passed, he's yeah. passed away. Sorry, I'm so, so sorry. I'm thinking of Chris Knowings, uh, but Carlton, I'm so sorry that I forget his name. My brother that played me, he died, I think he had a sickle cell. So he's, he's, he's everybody else is still here, the, the, the kids. So let's, let's, we, you got one last question, sir, so we go to- Sure, two, a drink, two, sir. we got one, we'll take one. Here's how, here's how we'll end it, right? Uh, we'll take one one question from the audience. You want to turn the lights on up so we can see the house? Uh, yeah. Anybody? But it's, uh, it's gotta be, so rules are, this has gotta be a question that uh, is gonna be epic, it's gonna cap the evening, it's gonna be also respectful and insightful. So who's still game? Uh, we got, uh, oh Jesus, hard. Do you guys want to choose which hand? I think you should have more than. What's that? I, I agree. I think we need more than. Ah, okay. Well, Spike was looking for a drink, so we'll do two. We're going to compromise and do three? Why can't he just order drinks? All right. All right. All right. Good morning, there's a bar. You are here. There's a special thing after this where we're going to party. Yeah, DJ. Uh, you came in late. Uh, oh, I came in late, sorry. We, we got it, we got it. I just, I think it's impactful. Hi, I'm Lamar with Brooklyn Magazine, and um, I'm really glad I can talk to you guys because I've, I've seen this movie a lot. I, I, first time I saw it, I was with my parents, and it moved me a lot as a kid. And Where'd you go? Uh, Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio. Um, and my parents are from the south, from Alabama. And um, did you go down south during the summer? Yeah, yeah, every summer. I was in Alabama, so that that scene, like the scenes down there, I was like, oh shit, like this is like my childhood. Um, but you know, I remember my parents used to talk a lot about you know how like their childhood was and how it related to them. And Tim, I remember you said at the beginning before the film started how you kind of was moved by it, because, even though you know you grew up in the suburbs. And I was at your block party um, for work, uh, Do the Right Thing, and I just overheard this kid, I don't know, I think he's like 15, 16, definitely like much younger than me, and he talked about how he had seen Crooklyn for the first time and it made him cry, and it made him emotional, made him think about his mom, and I think he said his grandma. And I was just wondering for you guys, you know, I know it's personal, um, it's semi-autobiographical, -autobi but, it affected me, it affected you, it affects so many people when they see it. And I just wonder if you guys can tell me, like, what do you think resonates uh, so much that makes this movie cross these generational and cultural boundaries in black culture and American culture, global culture? Thank you. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first, uh, as I've been interviewed early before, and uh, people stopping all over the world, total strangers, and came up and said Crook was their most, their favorite film. More than Do the Right Thing, more than Malcolm X, or any other film. People, total strangers say Crook when I'm there. Not even know these people, I'm not going, <laughs> I like that, to say, I want to tell you that Crook is, 
film you've done, I love the most. So I just, I think it has to come to, down to the, the family. The story is universal. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a universality to it, you know, with the family. I mean, we all have families. Um, and just that di the, the familial relationships, the dynamics, um, these are universal themes. And childhood. Uh, so there's a certain sense of nostalgia. And also, um, I mean, I don't know, it's such a good question. I, I Personally, I can't watch the entire film. I never watch it in its entirety. I just want to say that. I usually get up to a certain point and I have to go. So. Um, At any particular point? I guess. Yeah, when, when she comes home from the cell. That's that's when I check out. I have to physically leave it there. Like that tonight? Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it, I, I think really the word, the key word, the operative word is, is just a universality. I mean, it's a story about childhood and it's a story about, uh, you know, family and also loss. And even if one hasn't experienced that, it, you know, it's just something that, uh, that resonates. But I think the, you know, the, the family, the relationship, the dynamic, uh, I think that's something that we can all relate to. I think, I mean, I don't know, does that, does that sound right? Mm -hmm. It sounds right. Um, I, I, it's not a sentimental film. It was never meant to be that. Um, it's just writing from truth. And that might also have something to do with it as well. Uh, Even though it's a work of fiction, it is, it is really, it is autobiographical semi-autobiographical, but it is, there's a truth there and authenticity to that. Yeah, I never knew that you couldn't see, uh, so even tonight you walk around. I never knew, you never told me that. Mm -hmm. What about the premiere? No, the premiere I had to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Torture. <laughs> uh, are, you, oh, are, you, are you tearing up now? <laughs> I was, I was, this guy? what, I was had tears in my eyes back there too. I'm not blast when you're on blast. I mean, this is very, I was like, this the whole time. Oh. <laughs> nice, I mean, that's, that's our mother, that's our mother and father. That's our mother, there. that's our mother, and yeah. And so, I can't, I can't talk about it. I still can't talk about it, that's the thing. It's still, I still, this is, a, this is an event that happened in our life. We lost our mother in our youth. It was a traumatic thing, you know. It's it's it's. I I still can't really talk about it. And part of my wanting to write this film was to pay tribute to our to my mother and to honor her memory. And also, I wanted to do what she asked me to do. It's it was it was how I could manifest the assignment that I was given. I heard. And a piggyback on my only sister <laughs> is that uh, my mother would drag all of us to libraries, museums, plays, film. film. She was a, a since my father hated a movie, he hated how so since I was, old, I was my mother's date. And she, that's where, I mean, I had, my father was a sports fanatic. So I got the sports thing, the Knicks, the Yankees, all, I mean, from my father and, and the cinema came from uh, my mother, she loved. I'm gonna tell a story, I might have, you might have heard the story before, but it's a true story. My mother loved Sean Connery. <laughs> she loved James Bond, 007. And she took me to see Goldfinger. <laughs> Great open. James Bond films always had the best opening credit sequence. That film, somebody, Dom, Shirley Bassey. So as you know, I mean, 
Look, it's not hating on my Brooklyn brother. The latest, the latest, the latest James. Yeah, he lives in Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm not giving out the neighborhood anyway. Not, 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 not hating on any of those brothers. But I, I can hate some of my guys. My mother loves Sean Connery. I love Sean Connery. I thought she liked Marlon Brando. Brando didn't do no 007. <laughs> and my mother, my mother never took me to see no Marlon Brando film. Daddy and mommy took me to see the Missouri Breaks. And I must have been about eight years old. I was All like, right, well, well, let, me, let me finish my story. <laughs> <laughs> It was a big brother shit. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so you know, James Bond, especially the Sean Connery did all seven of those. Those the car chases and explosions and everything. And there was a low in the movie. It's quiet. You know what's up? I don't know the story. All right. <laughs> So somebody was, so there's a law, it's quiet. I mean, a few times, like, in the theater's packed, because my mother wanted to go. We went open a weekend. And there's a law. And I say to my mother, Mommy, why is that lady named Pussy Galore? <laughs> <laughs> the whole fucking audience heard that shit. <laughs> my mother grabbed my ass. True story. I don't know. What, what, what year that came out? 60, what year? 63? 64. I was seven years old. I don't know. That's, that's, that's a strange name. <laughs> what the fuck is that? I don't know. My mother knows. I'm asking her that. True story. We, we embarrassed our mother quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> stuff that we, did. we embarrassed mommy quite a lot. Especially in public. <laughs> I can't take you ragamuffins nowhere. Are there any other questions? <laughs> we we do we probably have a time. We do have another movie coming. We gotta do so. I do. We will do one more relatively quick question. We'll see. One more question. My question is quick. Since uh, Delroy, uh, Lindo, and uh, uh, Alfred Woodard had to play your parents, was there anything, any prep, anything special that you told them? that got them to capture the characters. Did, did y'all in the back hear that uh, about uh, uh, the, the parents, like anything you told them to capture the, the uh, performance? To make them feel like- Well, really Delroy asked, uh, and my father, I say, you're not doing it. <laughs> Delroy and I have talked in Fort Green Park, and, uh, and Alfred Woodard and I, Delroy and Linda and I, we met in Fort Green Park and we just had a conversation about my father. And there were things I didn't I didn't divulge everything, mm -hmm. but and also Alfred Woodard and I um, had met, and um, at the time I think her mother had passed away, so she was yeah. mm -hmm. so she was really um, she was grieving, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I don't and and outwardly so, but at that time I couldn't access anything. So I was, it was, it was interesting. I think about that in retrospect, because I couldn't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Is that word? We just said Delroy. <laughs> <laughs> so Delroy asked to any to see if you can meet my father. So no, nothing gonna happen. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. So I had a conversation with Delroy. But by saying he asked to meet our actual father, that, that did not happen. <laughs> But you know what's in, what's in this tape? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, this is the film that followed Malcolm X. So, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, my sister wrote the script and with the assistance of, uh, we have another brother, David, and I don't know what happened. He, David Lee is the still photographer on all my films since NYU, graduate right film school. So he didn't make it tonight. We're gonna see what happened. And was also also a great writer in his own right. He was a playwright growing up. Yeah, I mean we had a very very, very talented 
family. And here's something I'd like to end it right here. We were lucky because our parents never tried to crush our dreams. Whatever you want to do, you say, you know, you want to pursue it, you work hard, go in particular for, for some African American families. You know, when they hear their child talk about wanting to be a dancer, a writer, they can't see how that's gonna get to where they can be. So, you know, you wanna oh you be a teacher, you go to school, you go to you go to law, you go to undergrad, you go to law school, you want to business, you go to undergrad, maybe but the but they can't see how the route that's gonna get you. They want their children to be successful and have a career in the arts. Uh, and, and I've saved a lot of time. A lot of parents have killed, killed their children's dreams, telling them what they can do and what they should do. And in particular, if you know the sacrifice your parents have made to put you through college, and your major is poetry or <laughs> whatever that is, <laughs> You start feeling guilty because you know the sacrifice your parents have made and you end up choosing a path in life which is not what you want to do. Not what you want to do and you end up an angry, mean person. End up, you know, blaming your parents for you're stuck. And so life is not, does, not, does not bring joy to your heart. So our parents did, the arts is always encouraged. It's, it's, it's not it's not a mistake that we ended up all doing, you know, in the arts and you know, various aspects of, of the art of art forms. So it was encouraged. I just want to say, I really this has been really this has been such a pleasure, and thank you for having us. And I wish that we could have opened up more of a Q and A because I really always want to hear what people say. So, or maybe we can talk after. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna head down to the bar. So. Thank you guys for being a Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Hey, um, before, well, before, we, uh, before we depart, I got one, one last request for y'all. Oh, I'd just like to say one last thing. Yeah. This is the first film. Hold on a second, my man. Yo, yo. This is the first film. Ernest Dickens did not shoot for me. And so I'll give a shout out to Arthur Jaffa. Yeah. And, and he he really had it rough. Because Ernest Dickinson shot my first show from NYU, my second film, second film, my third film, which won the Student Academy Award, Joe's Best Life Barber Shop. Then she's gonna have School that do the right thing, more of was Malcolm X. So he was in a tough spot. I mean, like me and Ernest, you know, we grew, he went, and first of all, our first day at school, NYU, where'd you go to school? I went to Howard, HU, you know, where'd you go? I went to Morehouse. So right there, there was love. He went to Howard, I went to Morehouse. That shit was bonded right there. And so, to be honest, I was giving AJ a rough time. Because I didn't have my guy. And he was, he did a great job on the circumstances because this is the first time I had without my guy, Ernest Dickinson shooting the film. So if I think that, uh, you know, he, uh, and I might told this too. Oh no, so. Uh, all right, we'll go to the bar. I just want to say that I want to give my brother love for doing a great, great job on the very difficult circumstances. Thank you everyone for coming. Hey, before we go to the bar, do you guys mind taking a group photo with the audience? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll face this way, we'll turn the lights on, and uh, then every, if everybody can stand up in the audience.